Hello and good evening everyone and welcome to tonight's webinar, What's Wrong with My Tree? My name is Alice Phillips and I'm the coordinator for the Master Naturalist program in the North Willamette region. I work out of the OSU Extension Service Washington County office in Beaverton. And tonight we have Brandy Safel as our speaker tonight from Tualatin SWCD and along with Andrew here, who is our co-host for this summer webinar series. Tonight during the webinar, uh, we hope you'll ask a lot of questions. Please use the Q&A feature here of Zoom to ask your questions. And then I also hope that you'll join us next week on August 13th for our webinar, Wildfire in Your Forest Future. So I will let Andrew get us started here. Great, thank you so much, Alice. Uh, as Mel Alice mentioned, my name is Andrew Felton. I am an education and outreach specialist with the Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. And uh, tonight we're having our uh, What's Wrong With Your Tree webinar, where Brandy will be talking a little bit about um, tips and tricks and some signs and symptoms that you might see in local trees uh, throughout the, the area here. Um, we are recording this, this webinar and we'll be posting it up onto the, the Tualatin and Soil and Water Conservation District's YouTube channel uh, sometime this week. We'll also be sending out an email to everyone who has registered for this program with that link to the recording. So if you do have to step away for any reason or if you want to have a refresher, uh, feel free just uh, to wait for that email and it'll be coming um, your way as soon as we get the, the uh, webinar posted. We also have a uh, webinar evaluation that will pop up directly after this, this, uh, this presentation concludes. If you could take a, a few minutes to uh, fill out that questionnaire, uh, it is a huge help in us in developing this series so that uh, we can do a better job in the future and um, get you some feedback. And with that, I will hand it back over to Brandy. Thanks, Andrew. Um, yeah, so I guess I'll get started here. So um, as uh, they said, my name is Brandi Safel. I am the Forest Conservation Specialist at Tualatin Soil and Water Conservation District. And um, my presentation tonight is What's Wrong With My Tree? And before I get started, I wanted to just say thank you to OSU Extension and the Oregon Master Naturalist Program for hosting me. Um, that program is very near and dear to my heart, so I um, am very excited to be um, here to, to talk with you all this evening. So let me just get this going. Ah, there we go. Um, so just a little bit about soil and water conservation districts and particularly Tualatin SWCD. Um, those of you that were at my colleague Nicole's presentation a few weeks back have heard this spiel already, so I'll try to make it short. but. Essentially, we've been around since 1955. We're one of 45 soil and water conservation districts in Oregon. And our service area is Washington County. Um, so if you're not super familiar with Washington County, it's located up here in the northwest corner of Oregon. Uh, here's the county boundary. And we are called Tualatin SWCD because we serve the Tualatin Basin, which just about matches the outline of Washington County. Um, and what we do in the county is we work with residents to help our community implement sustainable solutions to conserve and enhance natural resources. We're non-regulatory. Um, we serve everyone. We're connectors and we work locally. We provide technical assistance to residents of the county with site visits, management advice, and then connection to resources. We also provide financial assistance in some cases and we provide education programs like this webinar. Um, and these are the programs that fall underneath the Soil and Water Conservation District uh, to Elton SWCD. Uh, we have a rural program, an urban program. I am the coordinator for the forest program. We also uh, have a stream enhancement program, invasive species, and conservation education. Okay, so um, that's where I come from. And um, I'm just going to dive right into uh, what we'll be talking about today. So. Um, I actually got a really great email from um, Alice before this uh, webinar, giving me a sense of what 
what all you are interested in um, based on what you put into your, the registration form. And um, what I learned is that about 50% of you own trees, forest, and or have seen issues with your trees. 25% uh, of you are master gardeners or Oregon master naturalists or backyard habitat volunteers. So you're providing some service to residents in your area. Um, and this information could be useful to you in that way. 20% are looking for some professional development which is also great. And then 5% of you actually own orchards or, or work in orchard management in some way. So um, I think that's really great. All really interesting ways that you can have relationships with trees and um, potentially be seeing some issues with them. So um, my background is primarily in forest ecology and management. And I have some secondary experience with urban and suburban tree issues from working with um, Oregon State University Extension for some time. And I was serving part of the metro region and um, part of my job was working with arborists. So I picked up on a lot of um, that side of tree health is working in, in urban areas. So I can offer that experience. I do not have much experience working with um, fruiting trees or orchards but I am going to do my best to refer you to some resources that I think would be really useful if that's something that you're interested in. And um, some of the guidance I'll offer about diagn diagnosing issues um, in, in trees is applicable across different types of trees. Um, so um, what we'll cover in this webinar will be relevant tree health issues, primarily in the Willamette Valley and the foothills of the Willamette Valley up into you know, more coast range elevation, um, urban and suburban areas as I spoke to, um, a little bit of a focus on native species because that's mostly what I work with. But um, again, some of the recommendations that I'll give uh, will serve um, non-native trees as well, those that you get at, um, that are more ornamental. Um, and the way that I organized this presentation was um, Based on my experience working for Extension, um, when I first started working there, I was an assistant to the forestry agent for my region, which was the Portland metro area, including uh, Columbia, Washington, and Yamhill counties. And part of my job was screening phone calls because there, the Extension office would get, you know, several phone calls a day from residents that were looking for help related to um, forest management, tree health, that sort of thing. And so that I would, I would receive all the calls and screen them for the agent. And the ones that were easy enough for me to tackle, I'd tackle on my own. And then if there were ones that were more difficult and bring them to the agent, we'd spend some time thinking about them. And then sometimes we would actually do site visits to get a better sense of what's going on. So what I wanted to do in this presentation is spend time on what I'm gonna say are like the top three issues that would come up in those phone calls and um, spend most of my time talking about those, but I'll also focus on a couple of side tangents that I think are important. Um, and then we'll go into uh, general diagnostics. So just some general guidelines for how you can figure out what's going on with your tree if I didn't happen to hit the thing that you were most interested in. And then also some resources for finding help, um, especially if you know you have all of your, you've done all of your diagnosis and you still need a little bit more um, expertise. Um, so I was thinking a little bit about this audience. I know some of you are um, not just uh, residents who might have trees on your on your property, you know, in your yard or own a woodland, um, but that that a lot of you might have a foot in urban areas and also love spending time in natural areas or own a natural area, but spend time in urban areas and you're looking at urban trees. So I, I kind of wanted to draw this distinction between forest health and tree health. Um, because forest health is a really appealing concept, but it can also be really difficult to define. Um, and that's because what is healthy depends a lot on the objectives and the values of the person that's managing that forest. Um, historically, um, in forest management, we really spent a lot of time just trying to totally eliminate diseases and insects. And although that's still a problem and like a, not a problem, but like an interest today, that we would like to make sure that insects and diseases aren't causing significant damage to forests. Uh, we're also mostly interested in this broader concept of health that includes all the elements of the, the forest ecosystem. And so for me, 
where the rubber meets the road when it comes to forest health is, is resilience. And when I talk about forest resilience, what I'm referring to is the ability of a forest to rebound from disturbances such as wildfire, drought, um, insect infestations, uh, you name it, whatever forces you see impacting forests, can that forest sustain some damage and then bounce back? So you might have a, a few trees die, but the forest as a whole remains intact. And in fact, some of you might be aware that some death in a forest is actually really good for the forest. So having a dead tree here and there, having a downed dead tree is actually incredibly good for, for soil health and for wildlife habitat. Um, and I wanted to use this picture as an example that's on the screen. This was at a property that I went to last year with, gosh, maybe 80 to 100 year old trees. The forest itself was in pretty good shape, but there were a couple spots where we had a few trees that had died. And what we figured out was that these were grand fir trees that had been attacked by um, fir engraver. And um, as you can see, this one did not make it. This one had sustained enough damage that it finally died. Um, but if you look around, the rest of the trees look pretty healthy. And in fact, this tree was covered in bird activity. There were lots of birds feeding on all of the insects that are nesting inside of that wood. Um, some of the areas near the top of the tree seemed like they had rotted enough that maybe they would make a great nesting cavity at some point um, for certain bird species. And when that tree hits the forest floor at some point, it's going to contribute to soil nutrients. So overall, this forest is generally okay. Um, even though you have a single tree that's died. If that single tree is the only tree in your yard, then it feels a little bit more like an issue. Um, and, and when we're talking about tree health, we're talking more about an individual tree and there's sort of an obvious condition to a tree. So it's just something in, like interesting to keep in mind when we're talking about tree health, because sometimes I uh, visit a property where someone has one Douglas fir in their yard that's died. And if, if there were a forest around that house and that one tree had died, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, surprising. But when you have one tree, it's a big deal when your one tree dies. So um, I think that's an interesting part of tree and forest health uh, philosophy to just sort of keep in mind. Okay, so we're gonna jump right in here and uh, talk about the first problem um, that comes up all the time in the phone calls that I get um, now and when I worked for extension. And this is uh, related to climate. So, so abnormally dry conditions um, in our, uh, particularly in the Willamette Valley, but across the state. Um, the entire state has experienced these various levels of drought over the past several years, um, roughly since the summer of 2015. But when I started working with extension in 2014, we were already getting calls about this issue. And drought alone can stress trees because of the reduction in soil moisture. Um, although native trees can actually be um, somewhat adapted to drought, they can deal with drought for a certain amount of years. Um, if you have several years in a row of drought, that can eventually kill a tree. Um, and what happens um, when it comes to like what actually kills the tree is that um, essentially uh, when, when there's stress on the, the water and nutrient transport system of a tree, there's almost like a, a tension within the, the trunk. And I'm trying to the most simple way to explain this, but essentially um, there's a tension that causes some of the vascular tissue to break down. The tree can fix that, but it can only fix it so many times before it's just broken. And um, when you have several years in a row of, uh, for example, falling off a ladder and breaking the same leg, eventually that leg is not gonna heal right. It might be causing you more issues. So it's the same with trees and can eventually lead to mortality. And um, at times also, I wanted to mention that drought has been paired with significantly higher temperatures resulting in what we would maybe consider it an extreme, extremely hot drought. And this impacts the vapor pressure deficit in the air, which can really stress trees out because of the way their vascular systems are designed. And there's certain trees where vapor pressure deficit extremes can have more of an effect um, on certain species more than others. Um, so all that to say, um, I have a diagram here on the screen that's showing the percent area of Oregon that has been affected by drought over the past two decades. 
And if you look at right around here in 2014, 2015, we see that more, um, almost 100% of the state at times is in some level of either abnormally dry conditions all the way to extreme drought. And um, we did have a little reprieve in, in 2018, but um, 2019 and 2020 um, looks like um, conditions are going right back up. And actually, I do have a figure here to share. Um, I just downloaded this figure from the US Drought Monitor website. And you can visit this website yourself if you check out this um, URL at the bottom of the screen, um, droughtmonitorunl.edu. And um, from here, we can see that as of July 21st, 2020, we've had abnormally dry to severe drought conditions in the Portland metro region. Um, so there are um, additional conditions this year that could be causing additional stress to trees. Um, and we could be seeing more and more mortality as we have been for the past five or so years. Um, and if that wasn't completely clear, uh, feel free to throw questions in the chat. We'll take a, a question break about halfway through um, so that we can catch the questions that are from earlier on halfway. So how does this look? How does it actually manifest when a tree is experiencing drought stress? So mostly we're seeing this in conifers. In some cases, you'll see it in broadleaf hardwood trees, but um, I'm going to focus this mostly on conifers because that's where I see the bulk of the damage. Uh, mostly Douglas fir, western red cedar, and grand fir. Uh, low elevation stands. So when I say low elevation, I'm thinking um, valley floor all the way up to maybe about a thousand feet above sea level. We, we're seeing these types of um, symptoms. Uh, also on stand edges where trees are more exposed, especially younger trees that are on stand edges. Um, or, or younger trees that have been planted within the past 20 or so years can be pretty susceptible. Um, we, we see a thinning crown, so you might see needle drop on the trees, as well as a, a stress cone crop. Stress cones can be kind of difficult to, to pinpoint, especially when the tree is mature. Um, but the one thing that really stands out to me is if the cones are, are small, and seem almost miniature for what a, a normal mature tree of that species, um, how their cones would appear. Um, you'll also see dead tops, like in the picture on the screen, these, um, the top usually dies first and you'll see mortality or you know, needle loss from the top down. And you'll also see branches flare out um, like you see um, on, on, the, on these trees in the image on the screen. Um, so as I mentioned previously, you'll, you'll notice that there's delayed mortality. Um, you might have a tree on your property that did fine in 2015, 2016, 2017, maybe all the way up until last year. And then this year it's starting to show some of these symptoms. And again, that's just from sustained damage over several years of um, stressful conditions. And then the interesting thing on top of this is that you'll have a tree that is experiencing drought and, and potentially stress, but then um, what that does is attract insect and diseases that normally wouldn't affect that tree. That tree would be able to um, muster an attack to get those insects and diseases out of, um, you know, out of the trunk, out of, off of the leaves, what have you. But um, with, with the uh, reduced response um, of the tree because of the, the stress from drought, um, you'll see signs and symptoms of these insects and diseases. Um, and so I wanted to share a couple of examples of what these might be. So with Douglas fir, um, the one that we saw maybe about four years back that was super common was this um, branch kinker. And I'm, I have a twig example right here. So it looks like almost like a dark area on the twig, a sunken depression almost. And when you peel this back, there's a, like a kind of dead tissue underneath. And this kinker is actually very uncommon on trees that are healthy, but as soon as they start getting drought stress, this canker can, can um, show up. Um, another, and you can also see it on the main stem as well, though it's more common on the twigs. You can also see little uh, twig beetles and weevils that are naturally pretty common on Douglas fir, and they don't cause as much damage, but they'll, um, because of the reduced defenses of the tree, you'll see uh, whole branches that can die. Um, 
And then Douglas fir beetle, as well as a very important um, insect in our area, this is a, a bark beetle. And it often is a natural component of forest ecosystems in Oregon, but with uh, lowered defenses of our, of our of Douglas fir, as well as um, large numbers of Douglas fir, this can create a stress, uh, stress signal that attracts the beetles and those beetle populations can build up and potentially um, create outbreaks that can attack surround, surrounding healthier trees. Um, and they only attack Douglas fir, just to be clear about that. But um, these are just some examples of insects and diseases that can show up when you have trees that are um, Douglas fir that are stressed. With grand fir, the main one that I see show up is fir engraver. Uh, this is another bark beetle that creates these um, horizontal galleries on grand fir. Mostly I'm seeing this um, around the valley bottom and into the foothills. Um, even in trees that are protected in the understory, it's really surprising because sometimes um, you, you think it's going to be older trees that are maybe a little bit more exposed or trees on edges, but even these trees that are sheltered in the understory um, at, at, you know, at the elevation of Highway 26 around banks, you know, I've seen a lot of tree of fur and graver um, damage in those areas. So um, that's one to look out for if you have grand fur on your property. And then with Western Red Cedar, we have this mystery decline that everyone's been talking about in the forestry world for a few years now. Um, this is a uh, issue that seems to happen in pockets. Um, if you look on the screen here, there's um, several Western Red Cedar um, dead all together in, in one pocket. And, and the interesting thing here is that this often happens in areas that you think are pretty protected, north facing slopes, usually along streams as well, where you think that the Western Red Cedar would have ample access to water and moisture in the soil. Um, but there's um, significant mortality. Um, no pathogens or insects have been associated with, with this issue. Uh, and the best guess that we have so far is that it is climate related and that often um, this might be more associated when we have hotter droughts, when the vapor pressure deficit, as I mentioned previously, is high enough that um, it, it seriously affects the vascular system of Western Red Cedar. This, of course, is just an idea and it's, it doesn't have a, a ton of support yet, but there is some, some um, research that I think is being stimulated um, to try to address this issue around the physiology of the tree because we're, we're thinking maybe that's what's um, the main issue here. Um, but just to be clear about the, the symptoms of this, um, Western red cedar does have seasonal foliage loss. So here I'm showing an image of what that looks like. Um, and we, we usually refer to this as flagging when you see um, a single branch or a, a small twig with some leaves on it turning red or dying. Um, and that is completely normal. And this is typically older foliage that's aged out. It's a, a natural process of Western red cedar shedding its older leaves, much like a tree that sheds its leaves at a certain time of year would. It's just a different cycle. But if you see a tree that has the entire crown turning red or brown, then that is a, a sign that the tree is dead or dying. So I um, just want to make that, uh, just distinguish that. Okay, so um, some of you might be asking, well, what do, I, what do I do about this? Well, some of the recommendations are pretty similar, um, whether you, you're managing a woodland, uh, whether you are planting trees in your front yard, um, one is to plant native tree species. This is a really important um, tip because um, non-native trees can be more sensitive to our climate conditions. There are some non-native trees that do really well here, but it's just one thing that a lot of our native trees actually do better and the ones that are adapted to your elevation as well. So, you know, as I mentioned, Douglas fir, Western Red Cedar, and Grand fir might not be great choices, but you could also consider big leaf maple, um, Oregon ash, Oregon white oak, um, one red alder, white alder, there's a lot of options that you could consider besides um, conifers. Um, if you do uh, decide to use a conifer, um, using a local seed source can potentially be helpful, partic particularly a lower elevation seed source of Douglas fir. 
or Western red cedar or grand fir. Um, local seed sources um, are determined by zones. And if that's something that you're interested in and trying to figure out, you can contact me separately and I can give you some information on that. But um, those seed zones tell you uh, a lot about uh, where that tree is appropriate to be planted. Um, you can protect established trees from injury. So this is a really important thing is especially protecting the root zone of the tree. Uh, if you are a woodland owner, making sure that when you're doing a forest operation that you're protecting the root zones of your trees and reducing the amount of compaction from equipment. Um, if you are uh, a homeowner and you just have a few trees in your yard, um, this could be making sure that you don't park under your trees, making sure that um, there isn't heavy equipment moving around your trees, um, that sort of thing. Um, you can irrigate your landscape trees uh, during the summer if it's particularly hot and it looks like there's going to be a lot of drought conditions. If you have a certain tree that you're concerned about, the recommendation is to apply water slowly over six hours every two weeks. Um, so not frequent shallow watering, but more infrequent deep watering. And you can use a soaker hose wound around the tree all the way out to the drip line and that should do it. Um, so that's, that's the general recommendation when it comes to irrigation. Um, you can also mulch to the drip line and that can help with, with moisture conservation instead of having um, vegetation around the tree that could be um, competing for water. Um, you would not want to alter any drainage near your established trees because those trees, especially if they're older, have built their root systems to take advantage of the moisture in the area. So if you change the way water is moving across your property in some way that could um, impact those trees. Uh, reduce competition, especially if the trees are younger, removing weeds from around them or um, invasive weeds like blackberry or scotch broom. And um, also to make sure not to fertilize during a drought because this increases the amount of leaf area and then therefore the, the moisture requirement for that tree. Okay, so I'm just going to talk quickly about defoliators and then we'll stop for questions. Um, so this is problem number two. This was a big one when I first started working at Extension um, back in 2014 because we had an outbreak of Western tent caterpillar. So I've gotten a ton of questions about this. They've trickled in over the past several years, especially with um, gypsy, European gypsy moth and Asian gypsy moth being invasive insects that we're concerned about. Those questions come in whenever we have western tent caterpillar and fall webworm out, um, large occurrence, occurrences of both of those species. Um, but typically when we have uh, defoliators in trees, they're either caterpillars or sawfly larvae. The major defoliators in western Oregon are up on the screen there. Um, but western tent caterpillar and fall webworm are probably the most important ones for you to know, especially for Y'all that are master gardeners, you're probably getting questions about these every once in a while. So they're good ones just to kind of have in your back pocket. Um, so Western tent caterpillar has outbreaks that last two to three years, um, and then they'll completely disappear for several years. They typically target alder, cottonwood, willow, or other hardwoods like Oregon white oak. Um, I've seen them on a variety of ornamental trees, um, mostly broadleaves. The only time they're, they're really an issue um, is when you have a broadleaf tree and the larvae fall onto maybe a smaller conifer underneath. Because the foliage on the conifer doesn't turn over each year and they, have, they hold onto their foliage longer, that can actually cause damage. But on broadleaves, what we've really found is that if you just let that cycle play out, the next year that tree will leaf out and it'll be fine. Um, it rarely has a long-term impact. There are cases of trees dying from tent caterpillar, but it's pretty rare and usually it's when the tree was already stressed to some extent. Um, these are early season defoliators, so you'll see them early in the spring. They create tints like you see on the screen. Um, and an important thing about these is often um, homeowners want to prune off the branches where they see the tent. And you can do that if you, if you, if you really feel, if, if maybe it's, if it's over a picnic table where you're planning on having some picnics or something like that. But what, what we've seen is that when you prune a branch with Western tent caterpillar off, um, the tree's already experiencing a draw on resources because it's being defoliated. And if you're removing a branch and creating a wound, it's gonna have to use even more resources to address that wound. 
So you could be stressing it out even further by removing the tent. So the recommendation is generally to just let it, let it play out and it should be fine. Um, and this is uh, an image of fall webworm. Um, this one, instead of being an early season defoliator, is a late season defoliator. So you're going to see it more um, around August. Right now, you might be seeing some of it into September. We see it on cottonwood, willow, alder, ash. Those species sort of scream riparian areas, and that's um, normally where you find this one is along waterways. I see it a lot. I, I live right off of the Columbia. So I see it a lot along the Columbia. Um, and it creates these tents or webs um, that you see on, um, I believe this is on a drone. And um, it's mostly a cosmetic issue. Again, with this one, it's not um, harming the tree. Um, but with this one, evidence suggests that you can prune off the branches and um, the tree will be fine. Although it's not necessary, you can also leave the the tents where they are and, and the tree will be fine. Okay, so um, I'll, we'll take a pause and Andrew, do we have any questions that we can answer right now? We do, yeah. So uh, the first question that came in is, is Western Red Cedar subject to fungal root disease? That's a good question. Um, it's usually one of the trees that's more resistant to some of the common root diseases that we have in northwestern Oregon. And I think that that's actually something that they checked out first when they started seeing all of these pockets of western red cedar decline. Uh, was, is this a fungal disease? Because it seemed, the pattern of damage seemed very much like a fungal disease. But all of the tests that they've run have come back negative um, for a fungal pathogen. And they've also tested for Phytophthora because it seemed consistent with some Phytophthora um, symptoms. So um, I guess like two answers to that question are um, there aren't common root diseases associated with Western red cedar in our, in our um, area. And um, they've tested for a lot of them and also the ones that aren't common. And we've come up empty handed. Great, thanks. Um, another person was asking if you could repeat the re re recommendations for irrigation of landscape trees. Um, they thought they heard that you said it was slowly over six hours. How often? Uh, six hours over every two weeks. Just double checking my notes there. Um, that's the recommendation that comes out of OSU Extension. Um, and I'll read it again. Apply water slowly over six hours every two weeks. Not frequent shallow watering, but infrequent deep watering. And they recommend using a soaker hose. Awesome. Thanks for that clarification and repeat. Um, and another question kind of on a similar pattern. Um, for individual tree health in drought, they understand that slow drip is better, but wouldn't a fast irrigation be better than nothing? Actually, that's a good question. Um, if you added some water, sure, it could be helpful in the short term. But especially when you're establishing plants, um, this is something that comes up a lot with when we're doing, um, you know, pollinator plantings on small properties. Folks want to run irrigation out to the to where they're doing the planting. And what we found is that when you irrigate uh, native plants, they, and non-native, I suppose as well, they don't root as deeply. And so you're sort of setting them up to not do well long-term. You're setting them up to feel comfortable with their roots at the surface. And then as soon as you forget to water or we have a really hot week, then those uh, plants really suffer because they're not, they're not rooted to the level where there's water moisture um, in the soil readily available. So that's typically why we recommend watering deeper um, more infrequently because you're training it to look deeper for water. Um, but yeah, if, if something is better than nothing, but um, if you can water deeper more infrequently, that's recommended. Awesome, thanks. And um, last question thus far, uh, this person lives in an older, in an area of older Oregon white oak within Shampooie State Park. Um, they've been getting uh, branch drop lately in the summers, especially on hot days. I'm just wondering if you have any idea of what might be going on. 
Oh, that's a really good question. Uh, there's nothing that comes to mind that I've heard about that would be causing branch drop. Um, one thought that comes to mind is it's not uncommon for some tree species to um, absize parts of their branching system to deal with drought. Um, Oregon white oak though is really uh, drought hardy. And so it would surprise me if it was reacting that way. If they are older Oregon white oak, they could also just be experiencing a little bit of decadence. When they get to a certain age, it's normal for parts of the bowl to die and start rotting and for the tree to just continue growing around the rot and for branches to drop off and for it to just sort of start branching out from where that other branch fell off. So it, it, it doesn't strike me as something to be concerned about. It, it might just be a, a relic of an older tree. Great. Um, and another question just came through of, um, could you provide some um, care tips for new restoration plantings in the first year? Um, how often would you water those? Well, I guess going back to the earlier question about watering, we usually don't um, recommend watering native plants if that's what you're planting. Um, it really depends on the situation. Um, if you have gone sort of the restoration route where you're planting a ton of plants, maybe four foot spacing across a, a large area, we, we recommend not watering them. Um, what we recommend doing is um, planting them in the winter so that they have several months to establish deep root systems and then um, let nature play out and see which ones survive and which ones don't, and then to interplant into the holes in subsequent years. Um, if you have a smaller area where you can, you can um, baby it a little bit more, uh, deep watering, um, like I described uh, previously, is something that we, you could potentially do especially if you've got non-native plants. I could see that being important. Um, yeah, and if you have native ones, I personally think it's better to just uh, plant in the winter and not water and um, let nature select the ones that are gonna be the hardiest. And then that way you don't ever have to water. Great. Um, oh, and I guess I'll also add, sorry, Andrew. No, um, in addition to watering, uh, vegetation management is really important. Um, so making sure that you're clearing vegetation from around the trees. I'll talk about, that's actually the next thing that I'm gonna talk about. So if you wanna segue into that, we could do that. Or is there another question? Uh, we have two more questions that just came in. So let's, 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 let's uh, that was a really lovely segue into reforestation. So let's, let's talk about that and then we'll um, pick up with questions at the end if that's okay. That sounds great. Okay, cool. All right. Oops. So um, the third problem that I wanted to talk about um, is, re regard is regarding planting and reforestation. So this is when um, either if you're a small woodland owner, maybe you've harvested or thinned and you want to replant a certain area, um, or um, in this case, in this middle image, you see this landowner did a thinning, but he ended up with an area that was um, a little bit open along the edge of his property along a road, and he wanted to plant this with um, uh, native shrubs to sort of fill in this area and make some pollinator habitat. Um, or you might just be planting an individual tree in your yard. Um, there's a lot of different reasons why you might be planting. Uh, there are some things to just consider to make sure that you have a successful uh, reforestation or um, planting on your property. Um, we were just talking a moment ago about uh, watering and I was starting to tell you about managing vegetation around the seedling. So here's a, an example of a grand fir that was planted in a field and uh, when this field was planted there was no vegetation but as you can see, a lot of things have started to come in and I, I think this was early May. And so in this case, what we did was we came in and um, we essentially made a, a four foot diameter um, opening around the tree. We did it with herbicide just because we had 11 acres where we had to do this for trees that were spaced uh, around 12 feet apart. So it's a lot of trees. But if you have a smaller space, you can um, mechanically remove the vegetation around the tree and just come in and keep weeding it. You can mulch it like in the image here in the center 
Um, there's a lot of other, I can, if anyone's um, planning, planting on their property and wants some resources, there's a lot of other ways that you can um, site prep and uh, post plant um, manage so that uh, the tree has adequate reduction in competition and moisture, avail moisture availability. Getting a little tongue tied there. Um, so this is a really important um, aspect of planting, that competition from grasses and surrounding vegetation really soaks up a lot of moisture. So getting rid of that, of the competing vegetation around the seedling is super important. Um, and I can answer more questions about that if that wasn't super clear. Um, I guess a, this middle image I wanted to throw up as well, just because um, I, I think it's important to also recognize that it's not, you don't need to nuke the site in order to, to plant. This landowner, uh, he mulched a lot of the, the leftover branches and tops or slash from the um, thinning operation that he had. And so he had a bunch of this, these wood chips down that were keeping weeds down for the most part. But he had some um, plants coming up in certain areas and we decided to keep most of them. There, there were some thistles and certain weeds that we wanted to make sure didn't spread. So we selectively treated those, but we left some of these just because, you know, they weren't interfering with where we were going to plant things. This was just a test plant that he did last year, but we're going to plant this whole thing um, in the coming years. And um, a lot of the things that were coming in were actually native. There's some miner's lettuce in here. I think there's some Oregon grape coming in. And so, you know, that's going to make a lovely understory to the planting that he's putting in. And uh, we didn't want to get rid of everything. So you can be selective about what you remove, but definitely around, um, you know, a two foot radius of the, tr of the seedling. It's important to remove any grass competition, especially. Um, and then another important issue is browse. So um, if you live in a rural area or even, you know, suburban areas can get deer. Um, it's important to protect them from um, getting eaten. So um, there's a lot of different types of protection you can put on trees. Um, this is a blue tube that we used for an Oregon white oak project and it kind of creates this nice uh, solarization effect. It creates a lot of heat in there, which Oregon white oak seems to like um, and it keeps the, the deer out. Um, you can also get Bexar tubing. Um, you can put up fencing. Um, that's another thing to really um, take seriously and consider. Um, and I guess coming back to that, Another reason why you might want to remove vegetation from around a, a seedling that you've planted is that rodents will hide in the grass and nibble the um, the bark of a young seedling and, and potentially girdle it and kill it. So creating that space around the seedling um, can expose a rodent if it were to try to approach it and make it more vulnerable to being hunted. So that's a, another reason to um, clear that space. Um, um, invasive weeds, um, I'm sure many of you deal with them to some extent. Uh, these are, for those of you that aren't super familiar with the invasive weeds in our area, I have some lifted, listed on the screen. Um, these are uh, non-native plants that arrive without uh, natural controls like insects, diseases, and animals. Um, they outcompete native plants and they often dominate the landscape when left unmanaged. The ones that we deal with most often in forest lands are blackberry and scotch broom, which are shown up here on the screen, blackberry, scotch broom. Also English ivy, English hawthorn, English holly, knotweed species, various thistles, knapweed species. So these are, these are particularly um, tricky weeds to manage. And um, if this is something that you are dealing with when you're trying to get um, a planting started, maybe you're trying to prep the site for planting, or you're dealing with these weeds sort of coming in and um, interfering with your planting, um, please feel free to reach out to me because I can give you some individual resources depending on which weeds you're dealing with. Um, so just to wrap this part up, um, successful re reforestation um, really relies on making sure that you're picking um, select, selecting site adapted species. So often um, you can do all of the site prep right, you can do all of the post planting management right, but if you've picked a species that just isn't a good fit for the site that you planted it, it doesn't matter, it's not going to do well. So making sure that you're using resources to make sure you're planting the right uh, tree for the right place. Um, make sure you're finding stock with the correct seed zone if you're planting, particularly if you're planting conifers. 
um, handle seedlings properly before planting, particularly if you're doing bare root. Um, but there's also guidelines for how to properly plant container trees, which if that's a resource you're interested in, I can, I can send that your way, just let me know. Um, planting in late fall or winter, I, I think is ideal. If you're doing bare root, winter is great. Um, containers are maybe a little easier to plant in the fall, just making sure they get plenty of water when you put them in. And then um, plan to return and remove weeds around your seedlings. Um, I, I just want to give a little bit of a, a side note here on um, invasive insect pests. This is an issue that we, uh, these are insects that we are not currently dealing with in Oregon or the Willamette Valley, but could potentially become pretty big issues when it comes to tree health, both in natural areas and in urban areas. Uh, what we have on the screen here are the emerald ash borer, the Asian longhorn beetle, and the gold spotted oak borer. Um, these are insects that, like invasive plants, they come here without natural controls and often our native tree species don't have defenses to fight them off the same way they do native insects. So um, if they were to show up uh, from their native um, areas, like emerald ash borers from um, East Asia, gold spotted oak borer is actually native to um, the southern U.S. states, but as it's been making its way into California, and north, it's we're seeing it cause damage because it's encountering trees it's never encountered before, so there's no defenses. Um, these, when these species show up, they can um, decimate large areas of trees, and it, it, it really would um, become an issue that would have a huge environmental impact and economic impact in the Pacific Northwest. So, um, if this is something that you're really interested in and you want to learn more about looking out for these particular insects, there is a training called the Oregon Forest Pest Detector Training that's offered through Oregon State University Extension Service. Um, if this is something you're interested in, uh, I'll have my contact information at the end and I can always connect you to that website. And um, it's a great way, especially for all of you that are master gardeners or master naturalists that are speaking to the public about these types of issues on a regular basis. It's a, it's a good skill to have to be able to look out for the signs and symptoms of these particular um, insects. Okay, so I'm gonna do a little overview here um, on diagnosing tree health issues. So um, this is more uh, determining whether or not you're dealing with a, with a tree health problem. Um, if you've got a dead top, that is a pretty, a pretty clear indication of drought in most cases, but it can be an indicator of other things like bark beetles. Um, so if you see the top of the tree die and start to, you know, for, for mortality to move down the tree, that's a sign that there could be something pretty wrong with it. Um, poor growth, particularly with conifers, if you look at the top, if the top leader is really small, um, so the leader is the, the um, topmost uh, branch sticking out of the tree. Um, that, if that leader is, is smaller than potentially other ones around it, that could be an indicator that there's poor growth and that could be due to the site that it's on, but it could also be due to other factors. So that's something to, to look at, stay, take a step back and look at the entire crown of the tree and, and see if you can notice anything wrong with the leader. Um, if the foliage has become light green or maybe even slightly gray, that can be an indicator that there's something going on. Um, a thinning crown. Uh, another common indicator when there are bark beetles involved are these um, fungi uh, growing out of the tree. Usually uh, there's multiple, but you can just see one or two in some cases. And um, you can also see larger fungal fruiting bodies, often referred to as conchs in some cases, um, growing out of the tree. Uh, I think most of you are probably familiar with conchs from hiking in the woods. You can see those pretty frequently. Um, those are all indicators that there's some sort of um, fungal presence in the trunk, usually causing a stem rot. Um, sawdust like insect frasts. This image here shows um, what that might look like. So it's sort of a, it looks like sawdust in the ridges of a tree. It can be different colors depending on what kind of insect it is or um, how deep it's burrowed into the tree. But anytime you're seeing that sawdust like material in the ridges of the tree and around the base, that's an indicator that there's some insect activity happening. 
pitch streaming. So that's when you see resin running down the tree, either in tubes coming out of holes on the tree or um, yeah, it looks like almost like rainfall down the tree of uh, resin. That can be an indicator that there's been some sort of injury or attack to the tree. Um, and in some cases, one thing that I've noticed in with certain insect issues is that there'll be extra bird activity around a tree. Um, and that's definitely something to, to notice if for some reason there's a tree that didn't normally have um, 20 woodpeckers visiting it a day and suddenly there's a lot more of that activity. It could be an indicator that there's something tasty to eat beneath the bark, maybe additional insects than there have been in the past and something just to keep an eye on. Things that are not a problem usually, um, but can look like a problem are a lot of uh, foliage diseases. Um, the ones that I've thrown up on here are, uh, this is um, an anthracnose on ash. There's a lot of anthracnose species. This, this is just a, like a sort of a generic uh, foliage issue. And often on ash, I see this a little later in the year and it's when they're about to lose their leaves anyway, and it doesn't really seem to cause problems, particularly on Oregon ash. Their leaves look very mottled and unhealthy by the end of the year. Um, and it's not, it's not a concern. Some folks think that there's something wrong, but it's nothing to worry about. And then um, tar spot on maple is also, it's a, it's a fungal disease um, like anthracnose, but it's also really prevalent around this time of year. And the, the plants are gonna lose their leaves and not too long, so it's not it's not a huge problem. It doesn't impair photosynthesis too much on on, um, on trees. I see this a lot on big leaf maple. Um, some of you might be super familiar with these, especially the naturalists out there. This is a gall from a gall uh, wasp. It's essentially an egg sac, and sometimes you'll see trees covered in these, and it doesn't harm the tree. It's it's sort of a natural. Um, symbiotic relationship of, of wasps using different parts of oak tissue. Apparently there can be individual species target individual parts of a tree. It's super common on oak and they'll um, lay their eggs and the tissue of the tree will grow around the eggs and um, the, the wasps will hatch out of that. And it's um, not a concern when it comes to tree health. Um, sooty mold is really common on um, ornamental landscapes. This is essentially, um, usually if you look above the plant that has sooty mold, there's a tree that has aphid activity and there's a lot of um, sap dripping on the plant below it and that sap just cultivates this uh, black colored fungus that it, it just lives on the sap um, that's on the leaves and it doesn't it might slightly impair photosynthesis, but it's not considered an important uh, foliage disease. So that's, that's one that you might see. I'm sure master gardeners are very um, familiar with that one. Um, and then also um, sap sucker holes. If you see these holes in, in straight lines on trees, this is something that's really common in our area. And I've seen trees that have been hammered by sap suckers, totally covered with holes and they leaf out every year and they look fine. Um, so it doesn't seem to be that big of a concern. Um, I'm sure there are some cases where it could potentially girdle the tree, but it's usually not anything to worry about. If it's something that you're concerned about with, with one of your trees, there are some ways you can, you can scare um, sap suckers off from, from using that tree and I can forward those resources onto you if you're interested. Um, so diagnosis tips. Um, probably the first important thing is to identify the tree species. There's a lot of resources out there for that. If, um, if you ever need help diagnosing a tree species, you can always take pictures of it and send it to your local master gardeners. They, they know their tree species. Um, and that's something that I'll, I'll show you at the end of the presentation how to do that. Um, you can make a list of the symptoms that you see. So when we're talking about um, symptoms. Um, this is the expression of the problem. So um, yellowing foliage at the wrong time of year, resin or sap running down the tree at dead top. It's how the tree is expressing the disease. Um, signs of a disease are evidence of the pathogen. So that could be insect poop or um, uh, uh, holes on the foliage that are from insect feeding, a wound, um, a conch or a fungal fruiting body. Um, 
those sorts of things are signs. So making a list of each of those things that you see. Um, obvious causes, my forest health professor in college used to always say, used to always tell the story about how he was doing a site visit where someone had a tree die on their property. It's a big, beautiful old Douglas fir, I think. And um, didn't, couldn't really figure out what was going on. And then he realized that there was like a, a dead spot in the grass underneath the tree. And he asked the landowner um, what that was about. And the landowner was like, oh yeah, well, this is where my son parks the car to change the oil. And like clearly there was motor oil getting into the root system of the tree and causing some issues. So, you know, there might be some obvious causes like that that could be contributing to tree health. Sometimes it just takes asking people some more questions about what activities have taken place around the tree. Could be herbicide application or, you know, some sort of heavy equipment around the tree that might have caused that issue. If there are insects or um, fungi that you want to collect to show um, to show someone to get a better sense of what's going on, um, soft bodied insects can be collected in alcohol. So if you have rubbing alcohol, you can um, put larvae into rubbing alcohol and, and um, in a, a container that you can close. There are insect collection vials, but you, I imagine you could use a jar. Um, you can also use alcohol. You can, I, I've seen people use vodka, like anything that you have on hand like that can actually, um, um, it'll preserve the insect long term so that it's identifiable when you give it to an expert. Um, for adult insects, insects, it's better to put them into a crush proof container and then you can stick them in the freezer. Um, so that they um, don't get crushed and they um, freeze in position so they're easier to, to identify. Um, and then for fungi, it's better to put them into a paper bag in most cases because that way they won't um, get moldy um, and they dry out a little bit, but at least they don't get moldy and start to disintegrate. Um, you can also observe the pattern of damage in the area. So an important thing is to look at the pattern of damage on surrounding trees. Is it just the one tree? Is it all of the trees around it? Are you seeing various uh, symptoms in different stages on trees in an area? Um, the pattern can tell you a lot about what might be going on. Um, and also take uh, good notes or ask a lot of questions about how uh, the disease or insect issue or whatever is happening with the tree might have progressed over time. Um, did it just start happening or had you seen issues from further back and um, it had progressed over several years, for example. And also take really great pictures. You can take pictures close up um, or you can, um, it's important to take pictures close up, but it's also really important to take pictures a little further back, maybe try to get the whole tree or try to get the context that the tree is in. Um, lots of pictures helps whoever is uh, helping you diagnose the issue. Um, have more um, more to work with because if you just take one picture of a leaf it's not it's not super helpful um, I think this is master gardeners will be pretty familiar with this and a lot of professionals use this book as well these handbooks as well um, there are these handbooks called the Pacific Northwest pest management handbook disease management handbook and weed management handbooks they're online um, if you just search those terms I mentioned you can find them I'm sure we can also um, send this information to you in a follow-up email if it's of interest to anyone. But this is a great place to just start looking to see what kinds of insects or diseases are associated with a particular host species. So this is why it's important to know what tree species you're dealing with. What you do is you, um, in the search bar here, you type in what, um, what, what the host tree name is, and it'll give you a list of the insects that are associated or insect pests that are associated with that particular host species. And it's the same thing if you go up here to the, the plant disease handbook, um, you put in, you know, Oregon white oak and it'll show you all of the diseases associated with Oregon white oak. So that's a good starting place to figure out what might be going on. And you can Google, um, Google search images of that disease or insect to see if that's potentially what you're looking at on, on your tree. If you're a woodland owner, um, I think the best resource out there to start with is the Forest Health Highlights in Oregon. This is a pub publication that comes out from um, the US Forest Service and Oregon Department of Forestry. 
um, and it gives you the highlights of the most important pests and diseases throughout the state um, in the previous year. And that way you get a sense of what are the important things that I actually need to look out for and then where are they located? Because there might be, you know, sudden oak death is a really important disease in Oregon, but it's really only an issue if you live in um, southwest Oregon. Up here, we're not dealing with it yet. So um, not one that you necessarily need to think too much about. Um, so a resource to be familiar with um, when it comes out at the beginning of the year. Um, this, the 2019 just came out earlier this year. You know, you settle in with it and you, you read through what you might have. And then if you, if you start seeing the patterns of those signs and symptoms on your property, um, you can refer to some other resources like this one um, from OSU Extension, the Managing Insects and Diseases of Oregon Conifers and associated publications that come out of OSU Extension. And these are ways that you can either um, get some help identifying exactly what might be going on and then also get some um, resources on how to manage it. Um, and it's also, there's tons of specialists throughout Oregon that can come out and give you a site visit. Um, Soil and Water Conservation Districts, OSU Extension, um, Oregon Department of Forestry, your stewardship forester is always happy to come out and, and help you figure out what's going on on your property. Um, those are the top ones. So if you live in an urban or a suburban area, the resources that I think are great once you have your list of things that you've diagnosed about the tree, um, once you've taken all of your pictures, I think it's great to check in with the OSU Extension Master Gardeners. You can, um, I've listed the information for Washington County on the, on the screen, but you can try to find the Master Gardener hotline for your area. Um, and that's a great place to go um, if you need help diagnosing what's going on and then getting some, some good recommendations on how to deal with it. Um, in a lot of cases, if you have a serious issue with your tree, you're probably going to need to consult with an arborist. The, and the general recommendations for that are to um, get a certified arborist. International Society of Arboric Arboriculture is a great place to look. Um, you can go to pnwisa.org to, to get a list of arborists in your area. Um, we usually recommend getting three quotes, making sure your arborist is licensed, bonded, and insured, and to ask for references um, to make sure that, you know, the work that they've done in the past has been satisfactory. And then for home archer, orchard health assistance, um, the OSU Extension Catalog has a really a lot of really great resources. Um, this one popped out to me as maybe being a great place to start. And this is Managing Diseases and Insects in Home Orchards. Um, you can find that on the OSU Extension Catalog. And you also have a local agriculture agent in most counties in Oregon. So that's a great person to have out to your property to take a look at what's going on and maybe give you some ideas about what you could be dealing with. And there are also specialists that deal with certain um, types of fruit trees um, or nut trees that, you, um, that you're growing and managing and can give you some ideas about what you should do. Okay, so I ran a little long, but um, this is my contact information. And um, feel free to email me if you have any questions about anything that I talked about. And um, Andrew, do we have time for more questions or do we need to wrap it up? No, absolutely. We have plenty of time for more questions. Great. Um, so everyone, um, Alice has been putting in some links to all of these resources that Brandy has mentioned in the chat window. We're also will be including those in the follow up email. Um, so you will have a whole list of all of the resources that that Brandy has just uh, just mentioned. So um, don't feel like you need to go through and copy and paste everything over into a, a Word document. Um, all right, so let's dive into some questions here. Um, so the first question that came in over the chat was, can you go over the causes of frost and pitch streaming again, please? The causes of it. Causes, yes. Well, there can be multiple things that can cause pitch streaming. Um, sometimes if there's an injury to the tree, you'll see pitch streaming and, and that's essentially just the tree's way of trying to seal the wound. Um, often you see it associated with insect attack um, and it's also a natural response to try to pitch the insect out of the tree. Um, if it's streaming versus um, um, plugs, usually that just depends on the specific species of tree that you're dealing with. So it can just mean that it's a specific insect tree that 
changes the way that the response of the pitch is behaving, um, but generally it's insect related. Um, but it can it can be fungal related in some cases. Um, and then frass is pretty much exclusively uh, related to insect damage. And essentially what this is is that the insect is eating um, tree tissue and then it's pooping it out and it's leaving piles around the tree. Sometimes it's coming out of holes where the insect is in the tree. Um, sometimes from an insect leaving the tree, so you'll see it um, more like you'll see a hole and then frass below it. There's a lot of different ways you can see it depending on the tree and the insect, but it's mostly exclusively associated with insects. Great, thanks. All right, so going back over to our Q&A. So uh, this person has a street maple that had, that's much smaller and has fewer leaves than other street maples that they've seen on their streets. It's about 30 years old and the other maples on the street look fine. Any suggestions on what might be going on? You know, it could be, one, one question I have is, is it the same species as the other? trees on the street because that could be one thing is if it if it's Japanese maple versus a Norway maple they have different growth forms. Um, another thing to consider is where it's planted. It could be in a spot where the soil is more compacted than the places where the other trees are planted. That can really restrict how much a tree can grow is how much it can root and how much access it has to moisture and oxygen. Um, so yeah, I would check those things out first. Check out what the species is and then check where it's growing to see if there's um, anything different about that. Um, other than that, I, th I think those are the main ones that I would, I would check out. Makes sense. Absolutely. Um, so the person actually just had a follow-up that says it's the same species and the problem is just this year. So it's a relatively it's just this problem. year. Yeah. Okay. It could be, I mean, if, it, if it's in a spot that's maybe a little droughtier, it, it, could, it could be because of drought. And it was it, did they say it was just the leaves? Um, or, let's take a look here. They said that uh, it has smaller and fewer leaves than normal. Oh, I see, okay. Smaller and fewer leaves. That does indicate that there might be an issue. Um, smaller and fewer leaves can, can indicate water stress. Um, it, and it, I would look at the spot where it's growing and see maybe if it's just not, maybe it's a droughtier spot and this year it's finally getting affected by droughtier summers. Um, maybe another thing to, to figure out is if there's been herbicide damage around that tree. That can also have an impact on uh, the way that the leaves grow when they bud out. Um, yeah, and keep an eye on it. That It could just be a weird year for that tree, and sometimes the leaf out, it'll be a weird year, and then the next year it'll be fine. So it might just be a tree to keep your eye on um, for, the, for the season, and then see how it does next year. That makes, that makes a ton of sense. Um, another question is about ornamental cherries. So this person has an ornamental cherry on their property. Um, sometimes the top leaves look wilted. Um, it's about 20 feet tall and they're wondering if it's a water issue or if it might be something else. Top leaves look wilted. Wow. I'm honestly not super familiar with or how to manage ornamental cherries. But, um, it could just be the way that it grows. I, I would be curious if it's always looked that way or if it's a recent issue. If it's always looked that way, then it might just be the growth form. If it's a recent issue, then um, it might be worth trying watering, especially right now with how hot it's been, maybe giving it a month of some deep watering and see how it does. Um, yeah, and, and then maybe next year, if, if it does, if it survives um, next year, starting watering early to see what happens when we start getting some of our first 80 degree days. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, this person has, this person mulches in their, in their orchard. Um, so they mulches on orchard trees, but recently they heard that mulching up to the tree trunk, um, at least with wood chips or bark, is not good um, for tree health. Is that true? 
Yeah, you don't want to pile it around the bottom of the tree because that can actually increase moisture and then fungi can establish more easily. So it's important if you're mulching to keep it away from right around the base of the trunk. It can be, um, it can be on the ground around the, like around the roots and things, but you don't want it piled around the trunk. That they're right, that's, that's not good. Um, this person took out a old black locust and now they have um, a lot of tiny trees all over the area. Any suggestions? I guess those um, tiny trees are pretty hardy. Yeah, black locust is, is considered a bit of an invasive tree. It, it's very prolific in the Pacific Northwest. It's, um, it seeds everywhere and creates a lot of small trees. And it also, when you, when you cut it, it can re-sprout from the base. So that's one where um, probably you're just gonna have to stay on top of removing um, the small trees as they come up every year. Um, you wanna make sure you get them before they produce more seeds and then sprinkle them all over the place that you've been making. Probably will just take several years of having to continually remove them. Um, one thing you could try is I would look into what the Pacific Northwest um, Weed Management Handbook. So the, that resource, here I can go back. Um, this resource, you go to uh, the Weed Management Handbook and look up a uh, black locust. It'll give you some recommendations for how to manage that particular species. And I have a suspicion that there might be a cut stump stump treatment you can do. So if you if you tolerate herbicide use, that's something that you can do. Or you could just mechanically remove um, those sprouts and seedlings until it just, um, until it's exhausted and stops um, sprouting and um, there's less seeds in the seed bank. Yeah, it sounds like there's thousands of sprouts. So um, going wow. going maybe more of a, a chemical route or checking out that handbook might be, might be your best bet to go. It would certainly be easier, yeah. All right. Um, regarding getting rid of competing vegetation, would solarization or oculation be okay for trees? Solarization or what was the second? Um, oculation. Oculation. I'm not familiar with oculation, but solarization certainly is a another method. Um, usually when I've seen solarization used in the past, it's more of a site prep method. So it's before you're planting anything, you would solarize a site to remove the weed seed um, load um, over a certain se amount of time over a season. And then you would plant once the, the seed bed is emptied. But um, that's a good question. I've never seen it done quite that way before, but sometimes you see um, black like landscaping plastic around trees, so it doesn't seem like it necessarily could harm it. I don't know. That's one that I'm going to say I'm not totally sure, and we probably consult with Master Gardener on that one. Yeah, we, we just looked up what oculation is. So it's a biological weed control technique that consists of covering soil with black opaque past, um, plastic and um, sheeting for eight, four to eight weeks before planting. So it's a pretty similar concept to solarization then. Right. And again, it was saying before planting is when you would before typically planting. do planting, yeah. Um, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I wonder if there's any master gardeners out there listening that might have some ideas. I'm not totally sure on that one. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, this person is asking for some advice on about leaving a snag or wildlife tree. When might it be a bad idea? When, um, when are some reasonable recommendations? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, often, so I mostly work with people who own woodland properties. And when it comes to leaving snags, um, it, it typically isn't that big of a deal because no one's typically out in, in far reaches of that property very often. So it's less of a hazard to have standing dead trees on the property. And it creates great wildlife habitat, um, both when it's standing and then when it eventually hits the ground. Um, if you are living close to a snag, um, there's a lot of consideration to take as to, you know, that tree potentially being a hazard. 
There are arborists in our area that can work with you on that and figure out how to modify that tree so that um, it's less of a risk um, and help you select trees that would be a good fit for creating a snag on your property. So, you know, a snag directly next to your home might not be a great fit because if anything falls off of that tree and it hits your home, that, that could be bad for, for you and your home. Um, but if you're far enough away and you could reduce the height enough and maybe even modify um, parts of it so that like a branch won't fall over where you like to have a picnic on your lawn or, or whatever, um, that there, there are ways that they can do that. So I don't have any specific tips about what to look for, especially since each tree is so individual and there's so many factors that weigh into whether or not it's a hazard or not. Um, but if you do have a tree like that on your property and you're interested in keeping it as a, uh, as a wildlife tree, um, I would recommend maybe looking up some arborists that can help you with that. Great. And we just had a master gardener chime in on solarization, oculization, and their advice is to also call an arborist. Oh, okay. Which makes, which there you makes, go. Makes a ton of sense. <laughs> um, all right. So getting back over to the Q and A, um, is there widespread oak foliage problems happening this year? Um, this person has had multiple questions from friends about their trees. You know, I have gotten a handful of questions about oak foliage issues this year as well. Um, it's, it's not anything I'm familiar with. Uh, the Pictures that I've seen have been on uh, le recently planted seedlings and it seems to me like one of those wait and see type things because it's not anything associated with particular disease or, um, or abiotic issue like frost or uh, drought or, or um, something that's not a disease or an insect. Um, doesn't seem to be associated with anything like that. So. Um, it's definitely happening and it's something I've noticed, but it might just be a year, might be a weird year for Oregon white oak and, and maybe there's just a little bit, a little bit of extra heat stress or, or something that's causing that spotting, but um, nothing I'm familiar with. I'm kind of sticking with the oak theme. Um, this person is uh, asking if you could please describe the best tree guards for native white oaks. For, okay, so for Oregon white oak, um, the image I showed before, I really like using the blue tubes. Um, so this is the, an image of the tube from the top. It's essentially a plastic um, blue tube that acts like a little greenhouse that you put around the tree. Um, and then you put a sort of a bamboo stake through it to get it into the ground. You can also put a few stakes in at different angles to keep it in place if you have deer that are particularly aggressive at pulling um, the tube out of the ground. Um, I've seen people use Vexar tubes in the past as well for Oregon white oak. That's one way to do it. Um, I tend to like the blue tubes a little bit better because it um, protects the whole seedling and it also provides some of that heat, like a, like a small greenhouse around the tree. Um, you could also consider cages um, if you can build a cage around the planting area, sometimes it's too big to do that. Um, some people have had some success. If you have, like, um, like if you have just killed a bunch of black locust on your property, so you have like a spiny tree. Um, if you've got a bunch of that material, you can sort of pile it around the planting. And sometimes um, herbivores will stay away from the spiny dead material around the tree and they won't be able to, to nip at the Oregon white oak. They won't even, sometimes they don't even notice it's there. Um, so that's sort of a more natural way if you've got a bigger property and you just make sort of a woody pile around the seedling. I've seen that work in some cases. Um, what else could you do? Yeah, it's seen tubing or um, brush piles seem to, I've seen all of those work in some cases. Great. Um, and it looks like, you know, kind of continuing on this oak thread that we got going, um, there's another person who has been seeing the same foliage problem that's existing that other folks are observing. And over the course of two weeks in March, the leaves went from looking very healthy to looking very brown. Does that kind of sound pretty similar to what, what you've been seeing or hearing about as well? I mean, the, the couple of problems I've had, I've heard about have seemed a little bit 
different on several different properties. In some cases, it's like a spotting. In some cases, it seems like the whole, like whole parts of the leaf become necrotic or they die. Um, so yeah, that's consistent with some things that I've heard about. Yeah. Seems like it's just something kind of moving through the area or something along those lines. But we'll, we'll also take a look out there for some additional resources and um, include it in that email that we'll send along to everyone. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this person has a magnolia tree that seems healthy, but the flower buds never open. Um, the petals are white and start to open, but it ends up just turning brown and falling off. It's been like this for about five years since they brought, bought the property. Interesting. Again, I'm, I'm not a huge expert with ornamental trees, but um, when I've seen something like that, when I worked for extension, I'd say that it might have something to do with the variety. Um, if you have neighbors that have it and it seems like it's doing okay, then then clearly it's not the variety. But it, you know, sometimes you buy a certain variety of a tree, it just doesn't it just doesn't do well here, or it doesn't do well with the soil that it's been given, or um, the location it has in your yard. Um, that might be one for a master gardener. I'm going to hand that one off. And we actually just had somebody respond as well. So uh, they're saying that magnolias short on water typically will brown out their buds. Um, so it might be, might be a water issue. Interesting. Interesting. Thank you to whoever chimed in with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, can you talk briefly about general tree health, specifically how to improve the health of a maple forest that has never, that has been left wild after logging with suckers galore? Oh, how old is it? I swear. I will let you know when I hear. <laughs> well, okay, I'll just speak, I'll speak generally. Um, so this is a super common issue. Um, Particularly in the 1990s, there were a lot of forests that were locked over because the markets were really good around that time and were not replanted properly. You see this a lot in the property surrounding Forest Park, parts of Forest Park, um, and even into um, Washington County where I work. There's a lot of properties that have um, forests that are essentially cut over uh, big leaf maple that has sprouted and then those sprouts just continue to grow and you end up with these maple clumps that have stems that are, you know, eight to 10 inches large, but they're, um, but they are in a clump growing together. And because of the way that they've grown, the stems are actually pretty weak. They're not attached as, uh, as securely as they would if they were a single stem or even just a, a branch stem. So they're likely to rot, rot issues or they can fall apart pretty easily. They take up a lot of um, canopy space and make it hard for other things to grow. Um, so it is kind of an, an issue that's that's not um, uncommon in, in our area. And um, usually what we recommend with that is um, if you've got a clump that has stems that are maybe about six inches or bigger in general on average, you can um, prune those. It would be a thinning operation. You'd have to have some equipment or folks with chainsaws come in and prune off tree, uh, some of the weaker stems on the edges or the smaller stems and leave two to three larger stems um, of that tree. Um, and you would do that to all those bigger clumps. And then for the smaller ones, you could actually take those all the way down because often, you know, if it's six inches or smaller, um, most of the stems are on the smaller side take out, you can take out the whole tree, and then you can replant with some other things to create some diversity in the forest, which is a mark of resilience, which is something I talked about earlier. When you have diversity of tree species on your property, it just means that you have more options if, if one species gets a disease or um, suffers from drought or gets an insect issue. You have other trees that are still there on the property. So having a diversity of species mixed up on the property um, is a sign of resilience. So removing some of that maple, especially those smaller clumps and planting things like Western red cedar, grand fir, Western hemlock. Um, those, those are the big ones that are more shade tolerant. And if you have bigger openings where there's more light, uh, you could plant things like Douglas fir, um, red alder. You could plant madrone. It's a little bit harder to establish. You could try Oregon white oak. Um, 
there's a lot, there's some, um, there's a lot of trees that you could try in areas like that. And that's something that if, if that person wants to get in touch with me, I can give them more information about that. Yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think that's some really great kind of general tips to do across the board with, with big leaf maple. Um, so that's all the questions that we have thus far. Um, but if anyone has any questions, you know, on your mind after, after this presentation concludes, I will also CC Brandy on that follow-up email. So you will have her direct contact information. So if anything pops up um, after the presentation, feel free just uh, to send an email out to Brandy, myself, or over to Alice. And we're more than happy to either answer your question or try to, to help connect you to resources that might provide you with, uh, with an answer. And with that, I think we'll go ahead and uh, conclude for the, the night. Um, and as, as Alice mentioned at the top, uh, our next week's webinar is going to be about uh, wildfire in force, and it'll be on Thursday, the this down, Thursday the 13th at 6 p.m. So hopefully we'll see some of you um, at that time. I just wanted to throw out my contact information one more time and say yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, and feel free to contact me if you have any other questions. Great. Thank you all again, and hopefully you have a, a great night.